First speaker, please welcome Anna Salmon. How much it matters to know what matters. A back of the envelope calculation. Um, I'm actually, we're five minutes behind, so I'm actually going to skip a few of the slides, but I think it's going to work well anyway. Okay? So, I want to close by talking about the practical import of singularity scenarios the action possibilities that they open up, the likely effects of these actions, and what these possibilities mean for how we can most achieve the things we care about. So a quick outline of where I'm going. I'm going to talk about what humans tend to do well and badly as far as practical thinking goes. I'm going to build up a toolkit for how to back of the envelope calculations can help matters, apply that toolkit to various possibilities around the singularity, and to discuss whether to trust this analysis and where it leaves us. So as far as I can tell, practical thinking means figuring out A, what we care most about, and B, how to most effectively achieve it, which is unfortunately not the style of thinking that comes most naturally to us. <laughs> so more specifically, humans tend to act from roles rather than goals, which is to say most of our decisions made are unconscious and our stated reasons are confabulated after the fact. They're often guided by social roles or habits. I'm a student, so I should study. Um, and they're rarely based on honestly asking, how can I best achieve purpose X? Um, and a side effect of following roles and habits is that we often put loads of time into a work task that feels associated with the task, but buys nowhere near as much goal achievement as we could have bought with a bit of strategic thinking. Um, so example one of how costly this can be as an undergraduate, I spent thousands of hours studying because I saw myself in the role of being someone who wants to learn. But I didn't spend even 10 hours asking myself questions like, what do I mean by learn? What kinds of learning are how valuable to me? What specific studying activities do I tend to get specific sorts of mileage out of? And sort of how can I get the most learning from this process? Second example, also a real example, a fellow who's into medical school two years into a four years process. You ask him why, he says it's just because he wants to make money. He sees himself as someone who wants to make money and sees doctors as associated with making money. You ask him how much doctors make and how much he could have made in alternate careers. He has no idea. He hasn't spent two hours on the internet researching comparative salaries before deciding to spend four years in medical school to earn money. Yes? Um, and these examples are both terribly costly and terribly common. So... Um, Role-based thinking goofs up a lot even in ordinary contexts, costs us a lot even in ordinary contexts. But it might be expected to be especially failure-prone in new contexts for which roles aren't yet tuned, and for black swan type events that don't occur often enough to form precedents that get incorporated into the social roles that we often follow. Um, and of course, the reason why I'm talking about this is that singularity scenarios fit right into the picture for where we should especially expect role-based thinking to go awry. So it looks like a high-impact event that shouldn't have had time to filter in to the social rules and heuristics, what it means to be a good person and so on, that m many of our actions are guided by. Okay, so goal-based thinking seems like a clearly good idea, and to a certain extent we've all heard it before, but it doesn't come very naturally to us, and so we need tools <laughs> to be able to do it, yeah? First tool, value of information. Um, and value of information is a concept from decision theory for quantifying how much good a particular piece of information will give us. How much value, how much more of what we care about we can get with that information. Um, in the context of, decision of value of uncertainty in decision theory in general is that we're making decisions under uncertainty. So we know what we want. In this example, we want yummy cereal. Um, and we know what the options are. There's lots of cereal boxes to choose from. But we don't know which of the options will have the desired effect. And so we might want to buy information that will better help us achieve what we care about. Um, and so what value of information is, is it's a way of quantifying how much research on what issues is the best buy. Because um, you might think, I mean, sometimes people say, <laughs> you, you ask me questions like, how much research should we do, right? And sometimes people say something like, you should just do all the research and like, investigate as many avenues as possible as thoroughly as possible. And of course, this is the wrong answer. And the reason it's the wrong answer is that research has costs 
The time you spend doing it has cost. The time you spend waiting and not acting while you're doing it has cost. And so we need to know how valuable the research is and how to weigh off the research costs and research gains. So two concrete examples. Salary search, action in question. Should our fellow go to medical school? Cost of information, about two hours of internet research. Ballpark costs of mistaken action, something like 9,000 hours of, of, of studying and so on that requires to get through medical school. Is that actually the cost of mistaken action? Because you have to compare that option against like the next best option and the, next be the better option that he would have taken. Um, and there's temporal discounting. I'm leaving everything out because it's the back of the envelope calculation. But like even a very simple analysis with sort of so one-digit multiplication, estimates from one's head, is enough to avoid that fellow's mistake, right? Um, so in this case, value of information, two hours of internet research are clearly worth it. Second example, bean buying. So this unfortunate gentleman, who's not actually the fellow in the photo, I got a friend to pose, so he's framed, but this unfortunate gentleman has been going down the bean aisle, looking at every can, and figuring out which can of beans is going to give him the most calories per dollar. He's already done 30 cans. He's on can number 31, yes? And not surprisingly, when we try to do the value of information calculation for him, we find that the amount of the cost he's already paid for that information in terms of the amount of money he can earn with that time is greater than the cost of the worst bean can he could have bought, right? <laughs> Um, and so the moral of this is put your basic research efforts into A, high stakes issues, and B, issues that are tied to potential action choices. Um, and there's this stereotype, I think, of geeks where, like, pe people who are sort of trying to think everything through first principles and reason everything out from first principles and how it doesn't always work. And that's really not what the mathematics of decision theory points to, and it's not what I'm advocating here. So, a couple of general principles for back-of-the-envelope calculations, even apart from value of information. Principle one, don't be afraid to write down estimates, even if the unknowns are very large, or even if you don't know very much about the particular domain. And the reason you shouldn't be afraid to, make, to write down estimates is that we need to make decisions. Decisions are necessarily based on implicit or explicit estimates. And if we write down our estimates and put our thinking in plain view, we can often make our estimates better. We can notice errors in our thinking. Other people can notice errors in our thinking. We can begin to improve the process. Uh, but equally, I mean, principle two, don't trust your estimates too much. Estimates in, estimates out, right? Um, and if the issue is important, recalculate, look at how other people estimate these sorts of quantities and try to get the estimates better. So toolkit complete, let's apply it to the singularity. Um, so we're going to set up our value of information calculation. There's different types of AI design that may, for all we know, produce good or bad results. And at present, we don't really know which would do what. And so we might want to buy information, just like buying information about which kinds of cereal is yummy, yeah? Um, main impact, what's at stake if we do this? If we successfully shape the singularity between being a sort of good outcome and a bad outcome, seven billion lives plus all of the future generations that might exist if we manage to have it might lead worldwide, worthwhile lives if we have a positive singularity. Now, you can multiply that, represent that as being times n. You can think of each of the people around here as sort of having a set of echoes behind them, right? Potential lives that might someday exist. You can, n is the ratio between all of the lives, all of the value, all of the stuff you care about that's currently around on Earth, and all of the stuff that you would care about that could come into existence, yeah? So... <laughs> Note that if good and bad outcomes are both plausible to a singularity sort of process, and if changing the outcome is plausible, then heuristics suggest that singularity information is worth buying. This is not a bean can buy. And note also that meta information is on the subject is also not a bean can buy. So if you think there's you know, a 10% chance that some analysis similar to this is correct, you actually end up with high value of information attached to figuring out whether it's correct and sort of ironing it out and figuring out if it's not correct, is there something sort of in the vicinity that's correct? Um, sort of actions under consideration, because value of information only makes sense if, you're, if there are particular actions that the information might sway. Um, pursuing particular kinds of AI research or not, um, encouraging or discouraging such research, shaping safeguard procedures, 
building up mathematical theories that might enable a controlled intelligence explosion or friendly AI. Um, so what happens if we don't gather information? Uh, arguably, we stick to the default course, whatever that is. There's no information coming in. Society keeps on doing whatever it is that's sort of natural to do. Right now, that seems to be many folks trying to build AI, often with some thought at safety, if you ask them about it. But it, if you ask them about their thoughts at safety, it's the sort of thinking that reminds me of like Eliezer's biases and heuristics <laughs> discussion, right? It's not the sort of world at stake caliber safeguards that you'd want if it turns out that the world really is at stake. Um, and also, without information, you don't build up the mathematical foundations that might be needed to build a controlled intelligence explosion. Um, if we underestimate the risks, possibility of human extinction. If we overestimate the risks, put off a singularity and all the value that could create. So back of the envelope calculation, here we go. We're going to set it up. The, first, we're going to estimate the value that's being created from current total AI risks research which is going to be the probability that that research eventually shapes whether we get a positive or negative singularity, times the impact if it does. Then we're going to figure out the value for each full-time person that isn't engaged with it or that could become engaged, which is going to be the total value divided by the number of people who are currently engaged, which I'm ballparking is 300. There's more than 300 people who are a little bit engaged, um, and there's less than 300 people who are actually full-time engaged, sort of adding it up to make full-time equivalents. Um, so impact, 7 billion N probability that current risks research shapes the singularity. Um, I divided it up into a bunch of components and multiplied. I got 7%. You can try it yourself. You know, a lot of the fun of back of the envelope calculations, right, is that you can just plug in your own assumptions, see what comes out. It's a way of taking parts of your model of the world and seeing if when you think them through, they're consistent with other parts. And if you get an inconsistency, then you can sort of bang them together and try and figure out what's going on. Um, so according to that, right, value from current total AI risks research probability that it sways times impact if it does, because that's like 500 million lives times that future multiplier, which is sort of a crazy amount. Um, an impact per full-time person, we're dividing that 500 million lives times future multiplier by 300. 1.6 million lives times future multiplier. Also a crazy amount to be swayed by like one additional person getting full-time involved with this, right? <laughs> um, you can divide it up. Per half day of time, something like 800 lives. Per $100 of funding, also something like 800 lives. Um, <laughs> but it's sort of true, right? You, you don't tend to think of sales as being in the area of philanthropy, but it, it is true, right? Like, personally, I'm kind of selfish. There's a lot of things I like. I like hot chocolate. Um, but the, the area at which, and, I, and there's still a lot of things I like, even given the fact that it seems to me that the sale is going on, but the fact that the sale is going on means I end up putting the boundary between my personal wants and my sort of concerns about the larger world in a different place because of how much I can buy for a particular bit of invested time. Okay, so baseline, this is a lot more than you can apparently get from the best poverty charities. Givewell.org is a wonderful organization for evaluating this stuff, and Holden's here, I think, I saw him yesterday, so you should talk to him if you're interested. But, so we followed principle one, time for principle two. Don't trust this calculation too much. Many simplifications and estimated figures. But also, if the issue might be high stakes, recalculate more carefully. Um, academic background that can help toward more careful calculations. I've talked to about it with a lot of people. The bargain seems robust. Maybe you go for like a sort of soft takeoff scenario. You can get maybe, they come out maybe an order of magnitude lower, but it still comes out sort of unprecedentedly much goodness that you can purchase for a little bit of money or time. Right? Um, so if the analysis holds what follows, uh, well, it follows, get a good bargain. What it looks like concretely, one, thinking damn hard about whether this sort of analysis is right and where it might be wrong, even if that sort of thinking isn't always easy or natural. Um, two, starting conversations, engaging the best thinkers you can engage, so students, professors, smart friends with varied backgrounds who might bring something else to the table that people now are missing. Writing academic articles, particularly in moral psychology, computer science, policy and risk analysis. There's actually a lot of angles here, so if you're 
if you are someone who writes academic articles and you're interested in getting engaged with this stuff, talk to us. Or if you already have ideas for how to do this, talk to us again and we can sort of build more network. Uh, funding research, if your comparative advantage lies elsewhere. I sort of love this economy, right? I can efficiently, though I know nothing of metallurgy or farming, in a reasonably small number of hours, I can cause a car or meals for myself to be created. <laughs> and it works for anything, right? You can for any skilled skill in anything. Um, and helping create interest and research avenues within organizations that might be able to do it well. Um, so if you're interested and you're not sure if this is right, or you're interested and you are sure and you're doing things and you want to coordinate, I'd love to talk to you. Um, oops. So, oops. The last slide didn't show up, but it was just a slide that said, contact me, has my email address, a Salomon, or sorry, Anna, at singinst.org, S-I-N-G-I-N-S-T. I'm going to be around at coffee break if you want to talk, or at the close, rather, if you want to talk. Uh, thanks very much.